I don't know if you guys maybe have noticed, but I've been a little different the last few months. Abat le ciel. It all sort of started in, I'd say, February. I was planning to go to Thailand and we were going to meet freely in Durian Rider. Something subconsciously was like, I want to look good when I meet these people. So, like I was saying, um, period, gone. It's been gone. I am not healthy. I have this sort of like thing on my neck. I don't know if you have noticed it. It's been around for a couple months and I don't really know what it is. It's some kind of a dry patch of skin and I think I had something like this before in my life when I was 14 and I was diagnosed with anorexia. I'm so mad at myself that I, that I, I just, I want to be the best example for you guys and I don't want anyone to, to do this to themselves. Hey, I had lunch today with a young woman who uh, comes from a bit more of a conventional political science career path. She got a degree in political science. She got a job with the government, um, pushed papers around a desk for a few years, and now what do you know? I bump into her here in China. It's not a date unless I say it was a date. But hey, we met up and had lunch, talked politics, history, etc., etc., and it's very peculiar for me to have to explain to someone from that background and in that position that, yeah, I'm kind of sort of part of this political movement called veganism. Uh, <laughs> and one of the things I said to her, quoting one of my past videos, and I told her about the past video, I said, one of the things I say about this movement, it's simultaneously the realist and the fakest thing in the world. Like, in terms of the gravitas, the reality this has for us in our lives. I gave the example of the video I have up with Zaria, you know, uh, the agony of activism. I said during that video, both she and I break down weeping. And we're just talking about stuff like, you know, witnessing animals getting their throats cut, protests at slaughterhouses, the sense of hopelessness you have and trying to influence your fellow man to adopt veganism. In that sense, veganism is the realest thing in the world. It's much realer to us than, for example, um, the suffering of children in Vietnam was during the heyday of the anti-Vietnam War protests. And if you guys know anything about me, unless this is the first video you've seen on my channel, that is a chapter of history I care a lot about, and I've done a lot of research on, but there's a visceral reality to how we care about animals, how we care about animal rights, even how we care about ecology. For me, ecology is pretty visceral. I feel it. I do. <laughs> um, it's not just about knowing, it's about feeling, and it's about action. So there's a sense in which the realest thing in the world, and there's another sense in which it's just unbelievably fake. Is There's another sense in which we're dealing with this, you know, candy-coated, fat-shaming veneer of selling uh, body image, uh, selling diet books, uh, you know, the bikinis, the permanent vacation, <sighs> the women who are celebrated as great beauty icons who maybe aren't so beautiful anyway and you know all the kind of snake oil salesmen within what what is fundamentally a form of activism you know <laughs> it's 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 a it's a political movement whether you want it to be or not um ah, lifestyle activism permanent vacation etc cetera, etc cetera. it's just someone who's a complete outsider so i mean this was just today it was a couple hours ago i'm having lunch with this very attractive young woman but it's not a date <laughs> and i've got to explain to her yeah you know what i'm i'm a vocal person in this i'm i'm an aspiring activist myself um i'm in some to some extent i'm an influential voice within this you know upcoming social movement but yeah you know what um there are uh, shirtless selfie pics of mine on the internet. Yep. And she's shocked. And she's like, why? It's part, it's part of the reality of the movement today. People, you know, rolled in with this is diet and exercise and fat shaming. Yeah, you know, a related example for me before I get into the main topic of this video. You know, uh, there is a woman 
um, who was flirting with me in the comments section of my live broadcasts. I, I, my videos are posted to YouTube, but I do live broadcasting on YouNow. Similar sounding website, but different interface. People can chat with me real time. And there was this woman who was sending me kind of flirtatious messages. She, she'd been doing that for a while. She put in work. And there's another woman who I know from around the internet who just started fat shaming her. <laughs> who just started saying, you're, and it was really nasty too. It was really, I've seen photographs of you. You don't take care of your body. And she was at the same time boasting about how lean she was. So the woman doing the insulting, not the woman flirting with me, the woman, the woman insulting the woman who was flirting with me was like, you know, I'm five foot five and 125 pounds and you don't take care of yourself. You're like a fat piece of shit. This kind of, this kind of stuff. And I know, I know the woman making the insults, she's not trying to flirt with me. Like, it's not jealousy or anything. Like, I really just think it's the, it's the boiling frog syndrome for what's become normal. And the woman who, who had been flirting with me, this, this piqued my interest because her response was like, I'm not trying to be a movie star. You know, <laughs> like, I'm not trying to be a bikini model. And she said some things about her life. She was like, look, you know, like, uh. I, I'm in uh, biochemical research. Like, that's my field. <laughs> like, you know, it's like she's not dodging the accusations. I don't know. I, I don't know what she looks like. I've, honestly, I've never seen a photograph of that woman. But, you know, the point is, <laughs> maybe I could lose a few pounds. So the hell what? You know, like, where is this conversation going? And I love that. I think it's a very relaxed, very self-confident attitude to have to say, hey, my life is not about being beach body ready. My life is about biochemistry. In my case, oh yeah. So the, my stack of books is in the shot here. Uh, can I can I just push this out? <laughs> a lot a lot of my time is spent, you know, uh, sitting at a table, um, looking at funny little squiggles on a piece of paper, studying languages, history, politics, etc. To some extent, that's what my life is about, and to some extent, for me, going to the gym is just a pleasant break from that. But yeah, we have a very strange little. Um, political movement here in that, you know, um, money and sex and fame are major motivating factors. Have I seen worse? Yes. Uh, the situation, I think, in Buddhist politics is worse. And there it's money, sex, and power. A um, little bit of fame. A different set of motive forces and, you know, other forms of, of, of corruption, other, other aspects of human nature. Uh, come to the fore, but uh, no doubt. I mean, you know, I, I met here here in Kunming just a couple months ago. I met a guy who was a Vietnam War veteran, and then after he fought in the war, he became part of the anti-war movement. So he was a politicized, you know, uh, ethically motivated guy who had a lot of hands-on experience in the war. He did tell me some anecdotes about killing people. To be blunt, um, then he went back to the United States and he was involved in those protests. And he was a speaker. You know, he would go to organized events and protests and he would give eloquent speeches on what was going on in the war and uh, his perspective on why the war should be stopped etc etc um and when i told him just a little bit i just told him a few sentences what was going on in, in vegan politics he sat there and said oh yeah and he started telling me about the extent to which and i think this is an unwritten history he said you know what was going on in the anti-vietnam protests a lot of it was motivated by sex and fame and money. And those guys, like himself, who went around from event to event on American college campuses and gave these very eloquent, very pious speeches about why, you know, they should stop dropping bombs on Cambodia, stop dropping bombs on Laos and this kind of thing, or talk about the suffering of the innocent children. Uh, they were very much at the same time lining up their date for that evening uh, with the young women on the crowd, again, typically at college campuses. But hey, sometimes these were at uh, left-wing churches, you know, the, the settings for these anti-war protests. Very often they were. There were a lot of religious groups that were that were organized and opposed to Vietnam War. But whatever it was, yeah, uh, sex and money and fame and those motives were very much on the table. So it was interesting. It was refreshing to hear that. And he was... <laughs> Uh, he was someone who, I guess, benefited from that, or in another sense, he was somebody who was corrupted by it. So real talk, our political movement and its problems is not completely exceptional. I don't know if we're the exception of the rule or if this is the rule, but you see the way money, sex, and fame leads people around by the nose. I know uh, a certain friend of mine on YouTube, uh, the first month he made $5,000 on YouTube 
that really changed his perspective. And why five thousand dollars isn't that much money, but um, if you start thinking, what if I can make five thousand dollars every month? Then I don't need a job anymore. Then I don't need a career. Then YouTube is you know pays my rent. A little bit of money. I mean, some people are more easily influenced than others. A little bit of money, a little bit of fame, a little bit of sex. How much does it take to uh, to lead you down the road? Now, um, I was just looking at this video from Izzy D. Sounds like a rapper, formerly known as Izzy Davis. Now she just uses her last initial, Izzy D. And in a, from my perspective, she is not really examining or explaining what the problems were, but she was reflecting on the extent to which this movement influenced her just within the last few months to regress into an eating disorder. Apparently some years ago she was diagnosed with anorexia and she struggled with that and she felt she'd won. But she states very simply and very briefly in this video that in preparing to go to Thailand, where I believe I met her. She was in Chiang Mai at the same time I was. I met a nondescript blonde and her boyfriend at one of the vegan restaurants there. And they knew who I was and they said hi. But they were nervous but they were kind of glad to meet me. And I didn't, honestly, I didn't really recognize her. But I think that was Izzy D, who I bumped into. We didn't, it was, it was really, hey, hey, I know you from YouTube. Yeah, I know you from YouTube. Yeah, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get these noodles. You know, <laughs> that was it. Like, I'm, there wasn't any uh, profundity to the to that interaction. But um, I'm pretty sure I did bump into her. We were there in Chiang Mai at the same time. But long story short, she felt pressure to lose weight to go to that part of Thailand representing veganism, right? And we all know why that is. Like, in a sense, it doesn't need to be explained. We all know that within this movement, there is pressure on people as the face of the movement to be, to look like freely. Let's be blunt. And um, I think she's a, she's a kind of sad case study of the impact that has on some people. But let's unpack it a little bit here. It's not just to look like Freely. It's that you have to get the results in the same way that Freely pretends she gets the results, which is to say effortlessly. One of the big catchphrases that Freely has brought into the game is of talking about effortless weight loss, that the lifestyle and the weight loss is effortless. And I think we all know part of what makes this so sad and so sick is that these people, even when they don't have a full-time job, even when they're not raising kids, even when they're not giving lectures on biochemistry or giving lectures on the history of the Vietnam War, that actually these people are putting a ton of effort into maintaining their figures, male or female, into maintaining a certain aesthetic, a certain look, and they still struggle with their li weight. Their life is, is still struggle. And, and, and uh, Izzy D... From my perspective, she's another example of that. The, the, the illusion isn't just that she's lean. I mean, in a sense, she really is lean. The illusion is that it's effortless. Because the idea is that we're supposed to be selling veganism as a lifestyle that will let you achieve those results effortlessly. Right? And this has consequences. Hilariously, it even has consequences for someone like Izzy D. Now, Izzy D is not just motivated by money. If you look at her channel, it's very clear that her main source of money, her main source of notoriety, her main source of fame are these so-called ASMR videos. I, I guess they're like mildly erotic videos where she has her friend run her uh, run their fingernails through her hair. There's another one where she's using a, a brush to brush her friend's back. And they're like 20 minutes long each. And they've got... All of them have over 100,000 viewers. They have nothing to do with veganism. I'm not... My point is not to hate on that genre. It's it's kind of a weird genre to me. Again, I assume people watch it... Apparently, some people watch it because they find it relaxing or they find it erotic. Uh, but if she were motivated by money, every single video would obviously be that kind of video. It's not her videos on veganism as a movement or her videos on Thailand or her videos on any of this other stuff that's uh, bringing in money through YouTube. So I, I'm actually saying that to give her credit. And I'm pointing out that her talking about veganism or her personal life, that is, you know, in a sense, an authentic commitment to coming on YouTube and wanting to share something real, something that's important to her, something she feels that matters more than what really gets her viewers and what gets her money. So I'm not actually raising that to hate on it. I just say that uh, in terms of the, the, the push and pull of the influence that money might have on this equation, uh, that's there. But I mean, again, there's money, fame, sex, power. And I think really what we're dealing with here, with her case, her looking at her as a canary in a coal mine, it's the power element of the equation, right? 
It's the sense of authority and importance that someone like Freely had. In, in effect, saying to her, not actually saying to her, but the message of Freely's whole methodology is, if you want to come here to Chiang Mai, you want to be respected, you want to be a leader, you want to be a voice in this movement, you better lose weight. Of course, she already was lean, but she decided she needed to lose even more weight before she went to Thailand to be seen in that context. And as she narrates, she lost her period, she got critically underweight, she was getting some other symptoms, and she's afraid that she's really regressed into anorexia or anorexic type behavior, which in the past she was diagnosed with and she thought she had she had overcome. She thought that part of her life was over. And it's not. Um, and it's, uh, Anyway, all these things. I mean, there's a kind of power in pretending that these things are effortless. But, I mean, I'm not interested in that power. We, we, you do, can do that in Buddhism, you can do that in scholarship, you can do that in magic tricks. I mean, if the magician pretends something is effortless, pretends it happened in the air, is that more of a convincing illusion than uh, showing you a kind of struggle? Um, you know, showing that, that, that there's a price to be paid uh, on the part of the conjurer. Um, you know, I, I can see it both ways. For me... I, I'm interested in a totally down-to-earth way sharing with you the struggle that is my life. But... Just lately, it seems that trying to present... Again, you know what? Look, let's keep it all the way real. That is one of the reasons why my channel exists. Is that I was sick and tired of people saying veganism is effortless, and it'll make you happy, and it solves all your problems, and you feel great, and you wake up with tons of energy every day, and it's it's simple and anodyne. Uh, and I, for me, on both a deep level and a shallow level, I, I react to that by thinking, no, veganism is a struggle. My life is hard. You know, it's emotionally hard, it's intellectually hard, it, it's, um, it, it can be harrowing. I already used this example of, of me and Zaria. We both break down weeping in that video, talking about animals getting their throat slit. You know, the, the, the steps leading up to you becoming vegan can be very emotionally hard. And then, you know, what happens afterwards in terms of activism, in terms of the struggle to actually influence government policy, in terms of the struggle to bring about cultural change, in terms of staring in the face of the indifference and hostility of your own parents, your co-workers, your cousins, your, your best friends, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, that you care about this so much, and, and you know, and just going hungry. Fuck, today I, I went hungry for hours and hours of not being able to buy food because you're vegan. Yeah, some of that's shallow, some of that's deep. But to me, all of it is a struggle. So that, that illusion of effortlessness, it is one of the reasons why this channel even exists, why I take the time to come online and share my life with you people. It's because I want to talk about what's real. I want to talk about what's political me politically meaningful. And I want to talk about the struggle. And uh, anyway, so veganism as a social movement, but even as a diet, even as a lifestyle choice, I think, you know, it behooves us to be honest about that struggle. But for better and for worse, veganism now is linked to a lot of body image issues and a lot of, frankly, uh, de debates about anorexia, right? Now, as needless to say, I, I have no history in anore anorexia. Anorexia is not my area of expertise. There are plenty of other channels already on YouTube from people who are either currently anorexic or recovering anorexics. There's already a ton of material of that on the internet. So if you're looking for an expert insider's opinion on anorexia, that's not what this video is about. That's not what my channel's about. But on the other hand, already in this video in the last 10 minutes, I think you've probably gotten a perspective that's very different from what you get from the other channel. So I hope you hang with me for the next few minutes. I've got a letter here I'm going to read out from someone who uh, has recovered from anorexia. Or, sorry, is, or is recovered from anorexia. It'll be pretty obvious to you why she's writing to me right away. And she was actually asking me for advice about starting her own YouTube channel, uh, talking about veganism, etc. Okay? So now I'm going to read this letter. Hello, Eisel. Long-time viewer here. Before I get to my real questions, I just wanted to make a suggestion of creating a schedule for your new You Now broadcast because I always seem to meet, miss the first 30 minutes to an hour of contact. <sighs> You're not going to get scheduled. <laughs> but anyway, thanks. Thanks for opening with that. Um, I guess I'm writing this email to get advice for two main questions. Basically, if I should start a YouTube channel and if my story would even be worth telling. If it would give me, if it would give people more excuses not to go vegan or if it would possi possibly positively impact someone's lives. The next few paragraphs will probably be emotionally fueled contradictions. I'm giving this as a warning. I'm currently 23 years old and in recovery for an anxiety disorder, pardon me, for an anxiety disorder and bulimia nervosa. Okay, sorry, so bulimia, not anorexia. I've reached a stage where my anxiety disorder is pretty manageable and I'm just beginning to start recovery for my bulimia. I'm about to move back to a major city to start part-time classes at a major university. 
Um, basically, I'm just putting my life back together. So she does mention where she's living. I'm just censoring that stuff out. I'm just making this anonymous by removing the uh, the name of the city and the name of the university. I'll try to put my eating order to store. Sorry, I'll try to put my eating disorder story below in layman's terms, as I don't know how well versed you are in the terminology. In a lot of ways, my eating disorder was the beginning of a cycle of veganism, vegetarianism, and an omnivore diet. Five years ago, when my eating disorder first turned from disordered eating into an actual disorder, I was an omnivore. I ate mostly everything as long as it fit into my calorie goal for that day. And then I watched the movie Earthlings. That was when I first went vegan. For me, it was mostly an ethical commitment. I'm not going to lie and say that there wasn't a small amount of my eating disorder, perhaps 5%, uh, influencing that decision. I would say that this was around November 2013. That lasted, if I recall correctly, until the Christmas break during my first year of college, December 2014. So that's actually a pretty long run of being vegan, especially for someone with two serious diagnosed uh, disorders. But okay. Uh, during this time was when, so during this time, I first started showing signs of bulimia, binging, and purging. I'm not so stupid as to blame veganism for my eating disorder. I realized that it was a mix of genetics and environment that contributed to my bulimia. Though I think some eating disorder specialists would say that going vegan may have been a trigger for me. Okay. So this is someone who isn't at this point involved with the kind of peer pressure we've just been talking about in the movement or YouTube or anything else. I remember for weeks before Christmas break, I started to get the craving that some ex-vegans would talk about. Uh, though I think when you have bulimia, those cravings take on a whole new monstrous dimension. It's literally something you can't stop thinking about. It keeps you up at night and you even start to dream about food. Binging and purging is not just about the cravings, though. It's also about the self-hatred and losing all self-control um, during and after the binge. When you have a mental illness, your worst enemy is your own mind. It knows all your secrets, all your weaknesses, and how to break you. For a vegan, I think that one of the worst scenarios you could be in is being force-fed meat, dairy, and eggs. For someone with bulimia, it may be coming back home during Christmas break and seeing all the food that you were craving but didn't allow yourself to have for over a year. Not to mention the normal questions and debates you have to put up with as a vegan. So I gave in and ate meat, dairy, and eggs, the whole spectrum of the industry. So she means during that during that Christmas break. Uh, I do want to say that it's possible to be bulimic and stay vegan. I know people who do it, and I applaud them. After Christmas, I decided to go vegetarian uh, to try to have the best of both worlds, but I knew in my mind that vegetarianism isn't really helping much, but I didn't want to eat meat. This started a cycle of constant change between vegan, vegetarian, and omnivore, because she's struggling with her eating disorder. Um, during this time, I never expected to live a full life. I honestly thought that every year going past may be my last due to my mental health problems. Um, did this play a role in the self-indulgence and self-hatred cycle? Probably. So, some of you can relate to that and some of you can't, but when you feel like you're forced into a very short-term view of your own life because you're not really sure if you're going to be around five years from now. Real talk. That basically is the short version of my history with eating disorders and veganism. I'm now beginning a new chapter in my life where I'm starting to reach out and get support for my bulimia. I've tried reading about people's recovery with eating disorders and how veganism helped or hindered them, and the general consensus of how most specialists don't believe in patients going on a vegetarian or vegan diet unless they have proof of religious reasons. So this is the consensus among psychiatrists, I suppose, who try to help people with these eating disorders. Luckily or unluckily for me, I don't meet the requirements for inpatient treatment. So I have to go the long road of support groups, i.e. she's not going to be checked into a hospital. I have the choice to do vegan eating disorder recovery or just work with nutritionists and doctors. Um, I have more control about what my treatment will look like and how I'm going to go about it. I believe that I can leave a, lead a vegan life while recovering from bulimia. I'm also someone who's well aware of what relapse signs are and how to deal with them. I'm not here to ask you for eating disorder advice. Good thing too, because I don't give eating disorder advice. <laughs> I'm not here to ask you for eating disorder advice or anything like that. I'm asking you as someone who posts the ups and downs of their personal experiences in life on YouTube, even though it's mostly negative and real, uh, and some of the vegan community hates you for it. Sorry, I didn't really give the pot. That sentence didn't have any commas in it. <laughs> She's asking me as someone who posts his life, including its ups and downs, my personal experiences on YouTube, even though some of the community hate me for it, even though a lot of those experiences are negative. So, 
Is my story worth telling to a vegan audience? It wouldn't just be the eating disorder, but my views on current events in veganism, my experience with the mental health system in Canada, my recovery, internet culture, uh, Tumblr, Instagram, etc. Honestly, I can see other topics being more impactful, but my eating disorder is a big part of my experience with veganism. Okay? Um, So, I'm leaving off the ending. She writes other flattering things uh, at the end of her letter to me. So I did respond to her briefly in email, and I told her that I was going to record a longer video in reply. This video might be even longer than she imagined already. Um, My advice to her is actually no. Don't come on YouTube. And I've already, I think, covered one of the really important reasons why I would advise someone like this not to come on YouTube. I think that the type of really negative, you know, fat-shaming... Uh, body image based politics that we have going on within the movement now I mean sorry the, that was like the first 10 minutes of this video was talking about that in a pretty relaxed way um, I might be able to scoff at it I might be able to laugh at it and I do I mean you know some of you guys are forgetting yes Durian Ryder called me fat I laughed at it I thought it was hilarious um, for a lot of other people you know being humiliated publicly by an influential figure with that, possibly a figure they look up to. Like if you personally respect Dorian Ryder, you've been watching his videos for years, that may be extremely damaging. It may be extremely emotionally harrowing. And for someone like this, that kind of experience, put it this way, it's probably not what you want to be dealing with. Um, so one part of it is what we've already talked about in this video. Um, the the, the fat-shaming, image-based elements of what we're doing in veganism as a fledgling uh, social and political movement. That's one aspect. There are others. You know, I, I think it really does matter. For most people, including me, getting a job matters. Your boss and your coworkers can watch anything you put on YouTube. And the vast majority of people, in terms of their personality type, they're not cut out for that. I just mentioned I had a delightful uh, lunch appointment. I didn't call it a date. I met this woman for lunch today. To me, it's great. She can learn about my divorce. She can learn about my personal life. She can learn about my vegan activism by coming on my YouTube channel. I'm completely comfortable with that. Most people are not. And even if you think you're comfortable with that, you may be surprised at just how uncomfortable you get as soon as things are taken out of your control, as soon as other people are misrepresenting what you've said, people are expecting you to respond to a video they've made attacking you, etc., etc. And all that stuff, all those nasty person-to-person politics, those happen to channels that are way down at 200 subscribers, 500 subscribers. Really, there are people with under 200 viewers who've had terrible experiences. I've mentioned repeatedly this guy whose channel is called Don't Interrupt Daddy, who ended up getting fired. He lost his job because somebody who didn't like his YouTube channel, somebody, I don't know who, um, repeatedly made phone calls to his boss at work, made abusive and insulting and harassing and false phone calls to his boss at work. And that guy, he gets like 200 viewers per video. He's not famous. He's not making money out of YouTube or anything like that. He's a small viewer who stated his opinions, and his opinions were, you know, criticisms of Darian Ryder, right? So that's had devastating consequences for him just in terms of his ability to pay his rent, um, you know, keep keep a roof over his head, put food on the table, etc. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if he found another job quickly or not. I've checked his channel, but I, I don't have any update on whether or not he's, he's bounced back from that or not. So don't think that the price of fame comes with fame. When you have micro fame, you still have all the disadvantages of real fame. And again, for someone with this background, in terms of the two different diagnosed disorders you've got, it's a safe bet that you're not cut out for that. And keeping real, it's a safe bet you never will be. Not when you're 30, not when you're 40, not when you're 50. I assume you're in your mid-20s from this message. I actually don't know her age. Um, Look, I think there's this big kind of anti-shame movement on the internet, which is very misleading. I had people saying just within my Patreon group, pay $1 to subscribe to my Patreon channel, by the way, but we do have conversations on Patreon. And there were people saying, oh, it's wrong to shame someone for being a prostitute, and it's equally wrong 
to shame someone for being a John, to shame someone for paying money to have sex with prostitutes. Now, this is actually something I've done research on in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, in this area. I've done research on it probably because of HIV AIDS, probably because of human trafficking, you know, slavery, to be blunt. Um, there are different reasons why I did formal research on that, uh, that sector and those issues, ethical as well as political issues and economic issues and religious issues. They're all intertwined. Um, now, I actually have a moderate view of prostitution. I'm, I'm neither an extremist on one end or the other of that debate. Um, however, if you ask me, is there shame attached to this for no reason? No. It's completely sensible that there is shame attached to this. Now, that doesn't mean people. I think people should be thrown in prison for it. I think you have to have very moderate laws governing these things. It doesn't mean I want police going through the streets and brutalizing people with billy clubs. Um, but if you ask me on the cultural level, is there no reason why there is shame attached to a man paying money so that a woman will say flattering things to him and pretend that he's handsome and have sex with him in contrast to a man who builds up a relationship with a woman um, I don't know, because of his sense of humor or his charm or what have you, is there just no reason, is there no explanation for why shame is attached to one of these activities and not the other? No, I, I can't say that. Is there no reason why a woman who selects her mate or her boyfriend purely on the basis of cash, why that's regarded as more shameful than someone who makes that decision on the basis of a whole bunch of reasons, like he has a great sense of humor or boredom? or veganism. No. You know, shame is attached to these things for real reasons. And I know of other people on YouTube who have the bravery and, frankly, who have the economic uh, stability in their lives to come on camera and show you the meds they're taking, show you the anti-anxiety meds or the antidepressants or the different mind-altering drugs they take on a daily basis. That is very brave, and I do think for the right person, that's very useful. In terms of their personality type, in terms of what they contribute, to, I, I do. I, In a sense, I applaud that bravery. But if that person then says to me that this is something that shouldn't be in any way shameful, you shouldn't feel bad about this, you should be proud, like you should be proud of your meds, you should be proud of your disorder, um, you have to look at it from the employer's perspective. If you're going to be employed as a school teacher, does it matter that six months ago you were a prostitute? If you're going to be empl employed as a school teacher, does it matter that you're on antipsychotic medication and that you may at any time go into a dissociative state where you don't recognize the people around you and you don't know where you are? That's not that extreme an example of a psychotic episode, by the way, where you don't recognize the faces of the people in the room. It matters. You know, people feel shame about these things. People very carefully guard the reality of their diagnosed mental disorders, of their experience, you know, with the medical system, etc., for real reasons. Now, I have I came on and shared my life on the internet at a time when my prospects for employment were zero, and they're still pretty close to zero. Like the career I have in front of me um, is extremely humble. And if you guys have been following this channel for a while, you know I even signed up to join the army. I uh, uh, volunteered to go work in a mine. Uh, while I was in university in Canada, getting my second university diploma, I was applying for all kinds of crazy jobs in Canada, in Europe, in Asia, what have you. But my own career situation is so terrible that the negative impact of me coming on and talking about Buddhism is not that bad. And sorry, Buddhism, I said that as an accident, but it's true. <laughs> You know, in Japan, I think that was a problem. I think people in Japan did not want to hire me because of my material on Buddhism. But I've just I've put up videos talking about how terrible my experience was in Buddhism. And, you know, maybe from some perspective that's something to be ashamed of. From my perspective, I'm not ashamed of that. And I think I'm sharing something really important and meaningful for a certain audience. My experience in veganism, again, I feel that's something important and meaningful for a certain audience. And I just put up a video now, I think my most recent video before this one, is about how uh, when I was doing humanitarian work in Laos, the government there, some members of the government, very seriously threatened to murder me, very seriously threatened to throw me in jail, ended up being exiled, ended up having to flee the country amidst threats of execution, uh, execution, imprisonment. I was, I was persecuted, to put it in one word. Now, I'm not ashamed of that. But one of the reasons is I didn't do anything wrong. 
I was doing I was doing something completely moral. I was actually being employed by an agency that was handing out sacks of rice to starving people. So I don't feel someone's going to shame me for that. Although they do. People like Jeff Nelson try to shame me because I have a background in humanitarian work. <laughs> Jeff Nelson wants to shame me because I didn't uh, you know go to business school and try to earn as much money as possible with whatever you know mental abilities I've got in life. Well, no, I don't know. How about you, Jeff? You ever volunteered for a project to hand out sacks of rice to starving people? You ever had people threaten to kill you because you're doing that? You know, it is what it is. But you know, that's a funny story. It's a weird story. I'm willing to come online and share that, and I'm willing to deal with I don't know any shame that may be cast upon me. And there is some because people do try to shame me and humiliate me that way. Uh, but I've got to say, I've read your email. I've taken what you said here seriously. And my advice to you is, don't do it. You've got problems. And your problems are problems you haven't solved yet. And your problems are shameful. You may not feel any shame. Your friends may not see them as shameful. Think about an employer. Think about an employer who's hiring you to be a babysitter or a school teacher or a firefighter, if you want that as an example. Something where there are life and death, moment-to-moment decisions. And they want to know if you're reliable. They want to know if they can count on you. From that perspective, this is shameful because it makes you look unreliable. Real talk. If you are going to make a YouTube channel, you specifically, this one person who who wrote to me, I don't mean everyone, I would give you the exact opposite advice of the advice I give so often here about keeping it real. I think you would have to have a very, very carefully controlled, very narrow on-message YouTube channel in which you don't deal with those aspects of your life at all. And I mean, one of the reasons for that, psychologically as well as politically, is simply that your your problems aren't solved yet. These are problems you're still wrestling with. These are problems you're still trying to solve. And I think that someone could have said to me, so I just made I just made that video about the government of Laos threatening to kill me years and years ago, right? What if I had been making and uploading those videos while I was doing the job in Laos? What if I'd been filming myself handing the sack of rice to the starving family? What if I was making the video while the government official was threatening to kill me? (laughs) Or what if I was making the video even the next day when I'm sitting there like, yeah, you know, guys, yesterday this guy from the government threatened to kill me. And, you know, now they're kicking me out of my country. Oh, my God. It's not cool. It's not. And I know for me personally, psychologically, I don't think it would. A lot of people would be a lot of people. You'd really, really go through a lot at that time. So maybe, maybe this, maybe what you're writing about, maybe it's something you can talk about on the internet 20 years from now. 20 years is not a bad estimate. I don't even mean 10 years. Maybe 20 years from now. This is something you can put on YouTube. And maybe you've accomplished some, you know, a level of economic stability and just a level of authority in your life where people know you're reliable. Where 20 years from now you can talk about this, what you went through, and the people who have to trust you as a babysitter, as a school teacher, as a firefighter, or just as a friend, where they're not going to look at you funny. They're going to know, yeah, 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 that girl, Lisa, I don't know her name, just making her name. That girl, you know, she's a rock. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, did you see her video where she talked about what a tough time she had in her 20s when she was struggling with bulimia? Yeah, but you know what? Wow, she came out of it even stronger. You know, we, you know, if that's the situation you're 20 years from now, that's when you make that video. Not today. Don't do it. It's going to make you unemployable. It's going to make you miserable. And it's going to open you up to an unending cycle of fat shaming and humiliation and body image politics within veganism that, you know, that right now is an endemic feature of veganism as a movement. I I don't know if it always will be, but I can definitely say in the next two years, next five years, it's not going to change. When I first came on YouTube, people were shocked and horrified that I challenged that paradigm, that I challenged the paradigm of lifestyle activism, that I challenged the paradigm of the permanent vacation and said, no, this is bad and it's counterproductive and it's wrong. And in the last two years, I've got to say I'm winning in, in a major way. That's really been challenged. People view it all from a different angle. And that sometimes people want to insult me. They say, what have you accomplished in vegan activism? This is a battle of ciel. This is the channel that pulled the gods out of their heaven. Okay, um, I did accomplish something. And a lot of what I accomplished, it wasn't even anything I did. It wasn't any talent I brought to the game. That was an incredibly brittle, backstabbing, shallow paradigm 
that was so influential in veganism for a couple of years there. I think it had to crumble. I think it had to fall, inevitably. But I played my part, whether you see that as a canary in the coal mine or the tack that someone stepped on barefoot, whatever it was. Yes, you know, I did play my, my role in challenging that. And I hope that in the future, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I hope that the whole situation for this movement is more grounded in real politics so that the door is open for people like you to get involved, even if you are, to be blunt, psychologically fragile because you're struggling with bulimia, you're struggling with an anxiety disorder. I hope that we do have a situation where someone like you can share your voice and your perspective without having to live in fear. But right now, real talk, the fear is real. Abba le ciel.